we are so fortunate to have John Forty with us this evening. He is a garden historian and ethnobotanist who has directed gardens for Plymouth Plantation Museum, Strawberry Bank Museum, Massachusetts Horticultural Society, and Bedrock Gardens. As a Slow Foods a USA governor and heirloom and biodiversity specialist, his preservation work has helped to restore countless native and heirloom plants and has brought traditional artisanal practices to modern thinking. He has won numerous awards for historic garden preservation, children's garden design, herbal and historical education, and the 2021 Award of Excellence from National Garden Clubs of America. This book, this book was inspired by his posts as the heirloom gardener, John Forty, goes out regularly to millions on Facebook that value his uniquely curated blend of history, horticulture, environmentalism, and botanical art. His book can be purchased at your local bookstore and from any online supplier. And I do have to tell you that Oceanside Barnes and Noble has copies. I saw them on the shelf. And with that said, I'm turning this over. I'm going to mute myself and turn this over to John. Thank you so much. And I will get us started from the beginning, as they say. Super. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. It's really a privilege to be here. And um, I guess I just, you know, I'd like to start off telling you a little bit about how all of this came into being. Um, about three years ago, Timber Press had asked if I would write a book on garden history. And I think these days we're all looking at history in a very different way. And I didn't want to write another book about the Olmsteads and Jensen's of the world. I thought it's really a time for us to reconsider who was really doing most of the gardening in, in, uh, in and around the world and how people improve the quality of their lives fed their families, medicated their families, and helped civilize the world by the gardens in their backyard. Simple gardens that um, have really accomplished a lot. And so what came of all of that was a book called The Heirloom Gardener, Traditional Plants and Skills for the Modern World. And really, I look at this as a book of, uh, that's the art, craft, science, and really the serenity of gardening. I don't know about any of you, but for me, I think the, the world was a pretty challenging place over the last several years. And as the expression suggests on the left with one of the beautiful woodcuts by Mary Azarian, who did the woodcuts throughout my book, when the world wearies and ceases to satisfy, there is always a garden. And that's one of the great strengths of horticulture. And I've, I felt in the process of writing it that really these days we all needed some good news and ways to participate in meaningful change. And so I wrote this book as a way of exploring how each of us in our own backyards can create green corridors, green bridges from one yard to the next that enrich habitat, build community, and as Emerson says, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. So for me, I started very young with a great appreciation of horticulture. Um, and I think a lot of that came down to growing up, pardon me, in a part of a landscape that really inspired me to explore and appreciate the natural world. The um, Irish speak of tenala, the relationship one has with the land, the air, the water, and the deep connection that makes you at one with nature. Um, when I lived in Japan, 
there was a lot of conversation around Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing, uh, because scientists were really just starting to understand the chemical constituents in plants and the essential oils, especially in the evergreens that really just centered us and relaxed us as we went out into nature. Uh, there's a Native American writer, Linda Hogan, who says, walking, I am listening to a deeper way. Suddenly all of my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And our landscapes, for so many of us, speak to that, whether it's an old tree in the landscape, um, in my region, a stone wall that runs through the woods that reminds us of earlier agriculture, um, or the seashore um, where we live, or the plants of place, California poppy for you, or things like wintergreen in the forest floors for me. This is a picture of me swimming in the river where I grew up. And these are the types of influences that brought me to a lifelong love of horticulture and, a, and really a sense of place. And I think from behind our computers, it's a lot harder to live with a sense of place in our landscapes. And sometimes when we don't understand or value where we live, it's easier to, to degrade those landscapes or to not appreciate what's there. Um, I show you a picture of the Roxbury russet apples because the next nearest house to me growing up was a 1685 Shipwright's house and tavern. And in front of it was an old Roxbury russet apple. And that tree could hold the entire neighborhood of kids. Everyone would be up in that tree playing. And we knew those apples tasted nothing like any supermarket apple. Nobody sprayed them, but they didn't need it because they had this incredibly durable skin. But when people don't understand the history behind things, sometimes things happen like the new neighbors that bought that house and had no idea had the tree cut down before anybody could say a thing. And so sometimes we become stewards of landscapes when we understand that sense of place. And it's a wonderful reason why organizations like San Diego Horticultural Society, Massachusetts Horticultural Society, every garden club across the country really have helped install, instill a sense of place. So I want to ask all of you, who taught you to love plants and the natural world? This is my mind on plants as a kid. This is the world I grew up in. This is one of my neighbors in, a, in the hull of an old apple tree that's still fruiting, if you can believe it. Um, and a child playing in one of the children's gardens that I designed for Mass Massachusetts Horticultural Society. Uh, I put a quote in here from Rachel Carson, who says that if a child is to keep their inborn sense of wonder, they need the companionship of at least one adult who can share it rediscovering with them the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. And I think probably most of you know of Rachel Carson for her work, Silent Spring, but it's also that work that brought about the EPA and bipartisan legislation to really create environmental stewardship as a nation. And so really my book tries in many ways to be a book about finding and sharing common ground. And I think as gardeners, it is one of our superpowers. We tend to know how to reach across a garden fence, how to plant and sow seeds, and often seeds of change. So with that, one of the things that I try to do in my book is put forward many lessons, examples that we can borrow from history. And work to work with to create a more sustainable future. Studies today are showing that on average, kids know fewer than 10 animals and plants in their backyards, but they'll know often as many as a thousand corporate logos. And to me, that's a that's an epidemic, that's a disease in our nation. And one of the best ways that we can remedy that as Rachel Carson would say is, to take those kids out into nature, show them the love of nature, teach them about the plants and the animals instead of another logo that they are, they're going to find on a shirt or a sign outside fast food joints. In the past, people would go out botanizing. They would 
learn a whoops, sorry they would explore the the insects around them the pollinators and the plants they would often make herbaria and herbaria are pressed botanical specimens this one here on the left is emily dickinson's with the queen anne's lace that you can see um, and the prune uh, prunella they became documents of place sort of like when young women would make samplers and they were learning their stitches and uh, their ABCs and their numbers and the art of stitching. An herbarium is a great way to work with kids to learn about the plants of place with something that they can take through the rest of their li life. And in many instances, these have ended up in museum collections. And they tell us a lot about climate change today. We have Thoreau's, we have Emily Dickinson's. This is one that was made in a seashell um, that was in the collection of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And it was made by a young boy who sent it back to his sister for Christmas with pressed algal specimens. Each one of them becomes a document that you could take through life, really your own family's heirloom. Uh, but also a way that a kid's going to learn common and Latin name of a plant. Maybe they can help look it up on there with their app. Uh, and you can use your experience to meld those bits of information and teach the next generation and engage them. Because really, when we are fostering, uh, when we are getting out botanizing and teaching kids about the plants that we love, we're also helping to foster habitat when we plant plants that the pollinators love and that hummingbirds love, we get pollinators and hummingbirds. When you plant in um, things like sassafras or um, spice bush, you get the spice bush swallowtail, monarchs on milkweeds. They are, they're all part of that habitat building that becomes so important wherever we live that reminds us that nature is pretty fabulous and that there are wonderful things to explore in the, in the natural world around us in every field and every meadow and that's something that historically families got together and did when they went out uh, collecting in nature and botanizing that can happen when we explore the plants of place. For me, things like goldenrod and New England aster in California, California poppies and agave and all kinds of plants that really work well for xeriscaping, which is another essay that I write in the book. Uh, plants that really speak to place and remind us that by using those plants of place, we're building habitat. By leaving leaf litter and forest duff, we're getting a lot more of the insects of place and salamanders and bird populations that feed on them. Um, and especially planting these plants that are uh, beneficial to the pollinators that we know are all struggling. Because in every backyard, in every part of a landscape, it's about building community, not just communities of families and uh, neighbors, but environmental communities as well. My book is really a series of essays that explores many different topics, all ta uh, tailored to exploring gardening as a craft and living from the garden. And so really old ways come into that, learning from the past to foster a more sustainable future. If there's something that happened in the past, there's a way it's relevant to the present. If it's looking at making espaliered fruit trees, that's from a time when they were looking at cramped yards and adapting things like orchards to urban spaces, just as we often need to do today. Learning how to do things like build raised beds or raise plants up in pots that we might translate to um, our backyards or our patios or even a, a fire escape where we keep pots. But we can borrow lots of those practices from First Nations and really every generation of immigrants that ever settled here after them. It's exploring the tools and the food ways of each one of those cultures. And really, as Thomas More says, the ordinary arts we practice every day at home 
and in the garden, I will add, are of more importance to the soul than their simplicity might suggest. When we sit around shelling beans together, there are deeper conversations that happen. And then there are dilly beans that remind us about our summer gardens, even through winter, which I know isn't as big a deal for you, but it is for me. <laughs> Getting out foraging for things like mushrooms and enjoying the fruits of the habitat where we live. And so for me, I always like to start with the first layers in our landscape, which are the native, uh, in, uh, the native ways. Um, and the plants of place. So one of those pro, uh, patterns that was, well, that really traveled across the entire country um, from the Southwest out and across is planting, as you know, the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash together. And whether it was on your coast or mine, that pattern today is still known to yield the highest uh, to provide the highest yield pound for pound of any other method of planting known in the world today. It gives you a completely nutritionally balanced diet and all of those crops could be stored over winter or eaten fresh. The beans were fixing nitrogen in the soil for the next year's crops. And then the vines of the squash and the pumpkins were keeping down the weeds and helping to retain moisture, all skills that we need to know for the present day. It included also enriching habitat and building out those environments with things like Jerusalem artichoke or sunchokes, uh, an edible root tuber that has these beautiful flowers in summer. But as you can full well guess, if you've ever tried to grow them, you want to plant them along the perimeters of your gardens because every year you will be digging them up and eating them like potatoes all through winter. Same goes for ground nuts, Apios americana, another one of the root tubers that was used um, culinarily is used still. And so really my book borrows from many of those old ways, whether it's from the First Nations, from early methods of preservation, um, or teaching children about seed saving, to early school garden movements, present school garden movements, the victory garden movement from the uh, 1940s, and the ways of saving seeds for the future, the ways of bringing to community, community together around the table that are all part of that outgrowth of horticulture that really served as a meditation, as food, as medicine, but also a connection to the past when we had many times over to relearn how to garden, how to pass on those things. This is from an old Victory Garden poster that told kids, take up the weapons of war, spades, shovels, and hoes, dig up your excess lawn and plant a garden. And so many people today still know how to garden because of the Victory Garden era, but also it kept these skills alive for another generation, just like the school garden movement helped to, uh, at its founding after World War II, really um, connect more generations back to the garden again. So one of the ways that I think really helps engage new generations with gardening is foraging. Um, if I was there with you, I would like to ask all of you, how many of you grew up foraging? And I think sometimes people are shy about thinking they really grew up foraging or that it's just the domain of Brooklyn hipsters. But really, I think most all of us grew up foraging, going out gathering things like the black walnuts or blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, um, finding weeds that are edible and delicious like purslane um, or getting mushrooms, even wild apples or wi garlic or wild leeks, uh, which are ramps, rose hips for winter teas. They're all a part of the food and medicine that served us when whole communities were going out foraging together. It was a part of our seasonal life and activity as much as anything else. So my book has chapters on many different uh, wild plants and edibles and medicinals, um, one of them being fiddleheads. You can see some of the beautiful woodcuts that come from Mary Azarian's illustrations, beautiful woodcuts that run throughout, but also ideas to rekindle some of these old ideas of 
edible plants and forageable plants, but also plants that you can cultivate right in your own backyard instead of going out and over harvesting natural resources or ways of exploring how we can grow even from market some of the plants that we were formerly accustomed to foraging as they grow to be somewhat diminished in their natural environments. And at the core of my book really is, well, let's say the foundation of all of it is in heirloom plants. Heirloom plants are genetically diverse. They're open pollinated and they have been handed down to us as our cultural inheritance from every generation that ever saved them before us. And in that they are also seeds of biodiversity. Unfortunately, hybrid seeds are genetic clones. They cannot be saved from one generation to the next. And so there's a huge disconnect with our past, but they're patentable. So the seed companies have preferred to work with them. And yet when we have saved seeds from the past, we were buying or saving regional variations on every plant that grew around us. Things like eggplant that reminded you how they got their name or the squash or pumpkin of your region or a beet that really would do well where you lived. This chart came from National Geographic a few summers ago and it really demonstrates how over the last hundred years, we have lost over 90% of the genetic diversity among the food crops that fed the world. We've gone from almost 500 varieties of lettuce down to about 36, uh, about 550 varieties of cabbage down to about 28. And while it would seem like the whole world is available in our supermarkets, what we've lost is the apple that your community grew or a tomato that would thrive in your region that did well in your soil type. And really that's what each one of us was saving for where we lived was the plant best adapted to the light, the soil, the length of season, the length of day where we live. Maybe we like the red corn or the blue corn or the multicolored and every population saved things with the traits that were most important to them. Just as today we're, we're saving seeds that adapt to changing climates in the places where we live. And as this graphic suggests that seeds are really the true currency of life. They're those connections to the people that saved them before us. So in every community I've worked, I've worked to restore traditional heirloom plants, whether it's the eight row multicolor flint corn of the First Nations where I um, had worked in museums or seed packets that we found in the walls of houses um, in one of the more recent museums that I worked at. These are cranberry beans that were stitched up in brown paper with milkweed twine and worked to really try to reintroduce them into communities so that every farmer wanted to grow them, every chef wanted to serve them at the table, every farmer's market would carry them. And we could bring back those varieties that had long presence in our communities. Tried to make fun seed packet programs where we'd get kids to make these almost origami-like packets. You can see this one was uh, goes back to about the 18th century. This was partially eaten by mice, but it still had some white carrot seeds in it, some of the earliest carrots brought to the Americas. Um, so we grow out those plants and bring the next generations of them back to life. Because right now what we're starting to see so much more of are the small integrated farms that made up so much more of America's past. Native American agriculture was really horticulture and so much small scale farming is really more intensively tied to horticultural practices, but it's that closed loop cycle, raising some animals, maybe you're keeping some chickens, but putting the fertilizer back into the soil and keeping crop diversity alive in the places where we farm and garden. And as Daniel Webster said, let us not forget that the cultivation of the earth is the most important labor of man. When tillage begins, other arts will follow. The farmers therefore are the farmers of civilization. And one of the best outgrowths of that has been at the farmer's market. Um, in the last 
less than 20 years now, we have grown from fewer than 2,000 farmers markets to at this point, well over 20,000 farmers markets across America. So for all the times that I'm just holding my head in my hands, thinking about the state of the world, I also have to remind myself and everybody that's reading that we're living through a renaissance and horticulture and agriculture are bringing on that renaissance. And, and our farmers markets are a huge part of how we are reviving biodiversity in our nation and alternatives like organic and fresh produce. And in a world where on average, our produce is traveling thousands of miles to get to us, it's a great thing to be reconsidering how we grow and what we grow that we can be maintaining in closer proximity to our homes. It's also about the quality of food that's coming. I don't know if any of you remember, but really post-World War II food in America was pretty scary until Julia Child came along. We didn't have fresh mushrooms. We had canned spinach. We had all kinds of frozen goods that we thought were in defiance of the season. And that seemed so great to us. But fortunately, all of these things have broadened our palate and brought back a quality of food as did the resurgence in gardening. Right now, there are as many Americans gardening today as there were during the Victory Garden era during World War II. That's an amazing success story. And so for me, this is about really, yeah, <laughs> reconnecting ourselves with that source of food and remembering that it's also an affordable alternative. I love that Michael Pollan quoted me, quoting my little old Italian grandmother saying that it's better to pay the grocer than the doctor. And when we have farmers markets, when we have the ability to buy fresh food, we're better able to take good care of ourselves. And if you are what you eat, well, many of us are eating a lot of petroleum because of the ways that we're shipping food around. But if you are a gardener, you're able to eat wonderful fresh produce. And as this, as, as this suggests, if you are what you eat, don't be fast, cheap, easy, or fake. <laughs> um, it's great to be seeing new alternatives around organic food, or as your grandparents called it, food, and getting back to the idea that we're growing vitamins outside of our kitchen doors, and that we really are comprised of what we eat. There are studies that are showing how organic food that has attained full ripeness in the sun, instead of being harvested weeks before it was ripe and then gassed to turn it red when it gets to the market, will have as much as 70% greater nutritional value than some of the foods that have been in storage and never, retain, uh, uh, never were able to get to ripeness in a field, let alone all the pesticide and chemical residues that come in or in typical food. And so I really love to explore how we can all be borrowing from these new best practices, bringing them into our backyards and strengthening, strengthening our communities and our alternatives for horticulture and agriculture. And as Wendell Berry says, essential wisdom accumulates in the community as much as fertility builds in the soil. And our communities are showing the difference from all of this in, our, in the farmer's markets and in the food choices we have. So I just want to pause to ask all of you, how did the pandemic shift the way you live? Did you do more gardening? Did you do more cooking from scratch, baking? I think for so many Americans, that was part of what was going on. We started to explore and maybe just even remember what good cooks we are and that maybe on many days, I was remembering how much better my food is than the restaurants around me. And, you know, while maybe I grew older and wider during the pandemic, it was only because the food was so good and I was at home all the time. But now getting back out into the garden, I'm reminded that a salad like this is just the result of eating my backyard on any given day and making sure that the ingredients are fresh and nutritious. One of the groups, as it was mentioned, that uh, I worked with is Slow Food. Um, and partly, um, as May Sarton says, 
one of, well, one of the reasons that I've loved it is the expression that everything that slows us down and forces patience, everything that sets us back into the slow circles of nature is a help. Gardening, therefore, is an instrument of grace. When we can garden to bring food to the table, when we can recognize that our food is our culture and it's our identity and our wealth, we build longer tables as the expression grow, goes. We find ways to strengthen our communities by all of the plants that every immigrant group and every indigenous group brought to the table. And that's part of the strength in gardening and in exploring the food ways of place. So another way that I write about this in my work is to explore kitchen gardening, because there are so many wonderful ways in the past that we knew to raise kitchen gardens, but the strength behind all of them is that they were right outside our kitchen door, so that it reminds you if you're out there on a given day, and there's a lot of mint and a lot of parsley, it's probably a good night to make tabbouleh. Or that if you're a, a school kid and you're in the edible schoolyard, you're reminded that that day's lunch should be influenced by what's actually growing and thriving instead of what's on a supermarket shelf from thousands of miles away. So kitchen gardens and how to build them are a piece of all this, but also getting kids and the next generations engaged in them is as well. The entire book explores gardening as a craft, whether it's in how to build a raised bed garden or a hot bed or a cold frame, how to make herbal honeys or maybe do some beekeeping, how to graft an orchard tree or just effectively prune. They're all parts of the craft of gardening. I don't know how many of you now keep chickens or bees because of the um, pandemic, but I think a lot of us found ourselves with time to do these things that really helped us craft from the garden. And as Lewis Neiser says, a person that works with their hands is a laborer. A person that works with their hands and their head is a craftsman. But a, a person who works with their hands, head and heart is an artist. I think these are times to celebrate being artists of the garden. And I love that Alice Waters suggests that my book is, empowers readers with a toolkit of traditional and sustainable practices for an emerging art, artisanal crafts movement and a brighter future. I think part of what's coming about from these farmers markets really is a new arts and crafts movement, but it's horticulturally based. It's based in the land and what we can grow and create from these spaces and find new markets for. And really in many ways, consider our backyards our gardens, even if it's in the city, as something more of a homestead that we can be producing from, that we can be creating and rethinking systems from, whether it's how to maximize space for a garden that can feed your family, or a place to put up a clothesline, or a way to can and pickle, or just to have a workspace that's an effective place to um, cultivate and grow but really just rethinking that old farmstead, homestead model and turning it into a 21st century model so that you can be the most effective gardener possible and really enjoy your space, but enrich your entire lifestyle because of that new style backyard. It's borrowing from past practices like making wattle, uh, wattle fences. When people used to coppice trees and pollard trees or prune their orchards, even if you're just picking up free fall from your yard, it gives you sticks. And instead of sending sticks off to a landfill, people would make arbors with them, fences, uh, raised beds and uh, beautiful structures that can last you as long as any cheap plastic fence that you'd buy at a, a box store that's going to end up in, a, in the waste stream. And so instead of finding ourselves buying things that we don't really need. It's a good way to keep us working from the landscape. It's reminding us that our landscapes can offer us great enrichment, not just for ourselves, but for the habitat that we plant out for as well, so that we can grow things like persimmons and pawpaws and elder and cherries and blackberries and gooseberries and currants and quince that really help us engage with the fruits of our labors, but also remember what 
truly ripe food tastes like. You know, sometimes we wonder when we buy something in the store, why it goes from stone hard one day to mush the next day. And it's really because it was harvested that unripe and it's only just hitting your shelf as it's really going past its prime often. But when you get a true strawberry fresh from your backyard, it's another whole flavor profile, let alone nutritional value. So it's trying to find places for these things in our backyards and our school gardens, because often it's the thing that we're there to return to every year, year after year without planting a new. It's exploring herbalism from our gardens because for centuries, everybody was a household botanist at some level. We understood the virtues, the um, benefits and the properties of each herb that we ingested. And so we were only divorced from that with the birth of the pharmaceutical industry in the early 20th century, and for many good reasons. But what we're also learning now is with the chemical analysis of plants, we can meld past learning with future learning and reapply ways of using things from our garden, whether it's as simple as making a cup of tea, um, distilling some wintergreen, or just eating your kale. About five or seven years ago, when the pharmaceutical industry learned that kale was uh, good for colon cancer, they instantly tried to turn it into a pill, and the pill did nothing. And what we realized is sometimes you just need to eat your damn roughage, and the garden provides that. It provides direct connections. Sitting with a cup of tea and inhaling it, that's aromatherapy as well as therapeutic. Whether you're using bay leaf for, uh, to settle your stomach or mint, they're all pieces of an equation that the, we borrow from the past. And these traditional learning uh, learnings are just in, they're built into every part of our system. A pesto isn't just a she-she gourmet food, it just means paste. It's how you preserved flavorful herbs for the middle of winter time when you might not have had them in your garden. We knew that if you were going to eat raw fish when you had um, sushi, wasabi is a vermifuge. It kept you from getting intestinal worms. Or if you were putting stuffing in your Thanksgiving turkey, you always put sage in it. Today, we know sage is antibacterial. We know that St. John's wort helps with the sanguine humor or the emotional well-being. Comfrey, they call knit bone. And today we understand it regenerates cellular growth or that garlic is antibiotic. All of these were pieces of past knowledge that as gardeners, we can be relearning to use the plants of place. And as Wendell Berry says, herbalism is based on a relationship between plant and human, plant and planet, human and planet. Using herbs in the healing process means taking part in an ecological cycle. There's wellness in just that very thing as well, taking part in ecological cycles. It's also really fun to get to know our plants for some of the other poster children of the local foods movement, like the local beer movement. Um, it's been great to, as a herbalist and an ethnobotanist also borrow these past practices like using things beyond hops to brew and making grew it things like ale hoof and ale cost and mugwort just by their very names they told you they were for brewing but they helped us make amazing beers and seasonal ales like sage and spruce ales and beers that have been such a nice part of the local foods movement that we've taken into the future and I've had a lot of fun brewing with local breweries all over the country and serving up beer to a couple of our presidents. I've also had fun making cocktails and cordials from things like the elderberry in my yard that's coming to be ripe right now. Or these are island cocktails that we made out on Appledore Island in Celia Thaxter's garden for an eco culinary institute we hold every year. Um, there are so many ways we can enjoy the, the fruits of our labors in the garden. And as Thoreau says, we all need the tonic of wildness. You can even make tonics and bitters that, if you can believe it, are good for your liver and kidneys. If you're drinking, you might as well do that. So the book's about playing with these ingredients from your garden, whether it's plants like bee balm that you can add into cocktails and cordials, 
or borrowing from any other seasonal aspect in your garden. For me in my region, it starts off with maple syruping in the early spring, goes into strawberries and you know lavender wands, but it's reconnecting through all of the seasons with place. And I think our farmers markets and our gardens have always helped us do that. But there's a lot more joy into not living separate from those things, but to really being a part of each season. So the book gets into things like May Day and a lot of other seasonal holidays and celebrations. Things like how to candy Angelica or make May wine or sorrel soup. Um, how to enjoy rhubarb when it's in season and then move on to the next, to, to asparagus and play, just continue to play through the seasons. Whether that's in the things you eat or things like reeds and other artifacts of seasonal living. Beautiful garland, exactly. You gotta play from the garden. And people have been doing it for centuries. Reeds have been portals onto our door through those changing seasons. They were really built to be like the wheel of life to remind you that our whole life, we just keep moving through seasons, through the good, the bad, the ugly, but no matter what, we just keep going around and round. And that we're a part of that continuation from the past, just like our heirloom seeds reminded us. Our gardens give us things like heirloom and edible herbs that we can turn into chive vinegar or violet syrup or herbal ice cubes, um, or just getting to know which flowers are edible, like the Solomon seal that are just delicious, like garden peas, um, and getting to find new ways and new plants that you can eat and that you can turn into herb butters and herbal cheeses and honeys and salads that remind us that there's so much more to life than iceberg lettuce. As the old herbalists would say that the, a flower is the sweetest essence of a plant. So if we're just deadheading these things and throwing, in, throwing them in our compost, we're losing some of the sweetest parts of life that's been given to us. So eat your nasturtiums and your daylilies and your violets and Every part of that not only adorns the salad, but it's good medicine for the soul too. And those same flowers were the emojis of their day, sending uh, posies and tussy mussies with herbs. You know, everybody knows that a red rose is for love and every other flower had meanings that corresponded. These are times to learn to listen to the language that our gardens speak and to explore and play with all of those things. And as the expression goes, happy is he who had the power to gather wisdom from a flower. So my book really, whoops, um, tries to explore um, a lot of the ways that we can move on from it's some of the um, that have been ingrained into us, like keeping lawns. Um, and I think all of us know what water hogs they are and fertilizer hogs they are. And so I have essays about things like lawn as well. And really just exploring how, you know, I'm sorry, there's something that's cutting off the top of my screen. So let's see if I can move this away. Sure, here we go. So I'll read you just to give you a sense of the writing style in the book. I try to use a lot of storytelling as well as um, just, again, essays that carry you through a number of topics. But of lawn, I say, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit it, but I love my spring lawn. I relish its appearance, a clipped flowery me to buzz with life. I'm surprised by how much I enjoy mowing lush green stripes, like a kid proud of coloring in the lines. There is a mindless reward in mowing, a walking meditation behind engine and blade. I'm not an advocate of big monocultural lawns, but I am a grown boy acculturated to letting my mind wander while I create the appearance of order. In my landscape, lawn has its seasons, from dandelion and strawberry to goldenrod and aster. Forage teas, frisbees, blueberries, home brews, salads, robins, and fireflies along the way. Verdant seasons, seasons as dry as straw, and the majority of days between, just adequate. 
This time of year, pretty brown and dry too. <laughs> Along with the seasons, the menu for bees and butterflies shifts from spring clover blossom to swaying summer daisies and fragrant milkweed. Perhaps coloring them in the lines isn't as important as providing a vibrant habitat for kids, wildlife, and pets. So I will continue to reduce the footprint of the lawn I inherited with more meaningful landscapes. But I will likely always keep a small patch for spring, a happy habitat to celebrate the lush times along the way and to feed my need for a few straight lines. So with that, I have other essays that speak to plants like dandelion and how they can be useful for us and for pollinators. The book has lots of beautiful woodcuts like this one from Mary Azarian that shows up in my section on lawn. Um, but just many reminders of ways that we can be shifting our backyard and our, our, our entire landscape in such a way that we become more sustainable. We carry ourselves into the future with more grace, but also model the best practices we can from our knowledge base, but engaging kids who can also help us broaden our knowledge base so that we're learning together how to move forward into the future more effectively. As E.B. White says, I would feel more optimistic about a bright future for man if he spent less time proving that he can outwit nature and more time tasting her sweetness and respecting her seniority. When we leave the margins of lawn to revert back to things like milkweed from this beautiful woodcut of Mary Azarian's in my book, or to Joe Pieweed and ironweed and the spireas and all of the plants that really would take over in our meadows if we let them then we will see the resurgence of pollinators and um, fireflies and monarchs back in our landscapes again. So I'd ask you all again to rethink who taught you your love of gardening, of plants and nature, and really to ask you who you're mentoring now because really there are fertile minds just waiting out there for you and I to engage them. It's what horticultural societies are for. It's what your garden club is for. It's what your grandkids and your neighbors are for, is reaching out and sharing your passion for the landscape so that the next generation gets it. And maybe as much as all of us carry in our heads, it's also a good time to be humbled a little bit by the things that we learned from the past, like better living through science meant spray every chemical available to us in our landscape. When we get out with grandkids today, it's a great chance for them to look up something on an app that you might know in your head already, but the two of you can merge learning together or find out what sustainable practices they can share with us because really that's how we go into the future with grace and build some beautiful habitats and gardens and landscapes along the way. So I would love to encourage all of you, if you have not, um, get the book. I think you'll love it. I, I really enjoyed the process of writing it. I, I've broken it up into about, oh, I don't know. I think there are probably about 50 different essays. It has just beautiful artwork. This is, these are just the end pages with every herb that I write about in the book. Mary Azarian's woodcuts are truly inspiring throughout, some of them single page, others double page. And um, it's just a great book to be able to put up, uh, pick up and put down and read an essay, maybe find the thing you love most. Read about American chestnuts or um, zucchini or nasturtium, but play. And um, so the book is available, as was mentioned at your local bookstore. And um, I hope maybe you'll get it and enjoy it. Um, also, I have a page called The Heirloom Gardener, John Forty on Facebook. And I try to post daily on whatever is happening seasonally, environmentally, um, and culinarily, really, from our landscapes. Um, and mix in some art and poetry, all tied to back to the garden. So... With that, thank you very much for having me and maybe we can open this up to some questions if you have them.
Okay, Harry. I'm unmuted. So I'm wearing my bay wreath. It's a it's a little dry. I made it a while ago, <laughs> <laughs> but I have it at the ready for just such an occasion. <laughs> well, you've been crowned with laurels. You must have done something right. Yeah, I did it to myself. I'm smart. <laughs> 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 well, what's the expression? So you plant your own garden and no, so you plant your own garden and you decorate your own soul instead of waiting for someone else to bring you flowers. That's right. I've, uh, <laughs> I wear this every chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> In my um, family, nobody has a surviving gallbladder. So we use bay as tea. It was sure. a constant. So the way some people you may drink mint tea, we drank bay leaf tea in my house growing up. I, um, I've been drinking bay tea too. I have uh, I planted several here when it was the herb of the year in 2009, I think. And I now have a bay wall. It's beautiful. And mm. I, uh, if anybody needs any bay, just shout. <laughs> How um, does it ship? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, priority mail. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, I've got questions going here. And I'm going to, first of all, um, one of them is, what is the exact name of the Facebook page? Is it the Heirloom Gardener or is it your name? John Forty. It is the heirloom gardener dash John Forty. Oh, so it's both. Okay. Yes. Great. You're going to get a lot of people that are going to join that. <laughs> um, I am um, scrolling through here now. It occurred to me that our San Diego Horticultural Society's school garden grants are so apropos to your talk and how important the school garden and the kitchen garden and the teaching kids are uh, uh, is to the renaissance that you spoke of, of gardening. It's fabulous. Um, I answered the question about who taught me and it was my cousin. I didn't say uh, the whole story is I didn't want to learn it. it I was 30 before I wanted to know, and he started teaching me at 12. So we had quite a long distance before mm -hmm. I, I caught the bug. But Ida, uh, she learned from her grandmother in, she was in Chicago at first, and then um, in Southern California, and she's learned, she learned both sense of place in both areas, which is amazing. Um, you asked about foraging and I didn't start foraging until I was 50 and now I can't stop, but <laughs> um, that I came to that really late. Miranda has mentioned that in the pandemic, her cooking skills improved greatly as did her gardening. And I think a lot of us uh, have that. I got ducks in the pandemic. That's, <laughs> that was my, deal and I love those two quackers. <laughs> One of the questions is where did you grow up compare is it the same place where you live now? No I grew up down towards Cape Cod and I live in Maine now oh. um, but I grew up along a river and really I, I would say I was raised by a river <laughs> and uh, that river just told me stories as did the old gardeners in my neighborhood that helped me really envision those landscapes back through centuries really um the ship columbia that um went out and uh found the river columbia and gave it its name was built right below where my house is and um but it hadn't been a shipyard in over 100 years and so for me it was really an exercise in an imagination. Everything about the landscape, the well in our yard that had been there since the 17th century, the windmill at the Arts and Crafts Shingle Mansion up the hill from me that was in the middle of a high pine forest. 
that just wouldn't have made sense because there were trees all around it, but it made sense in another age. And those were all the sorts of things that pulled me in and made me curious. I think you're a poet. Do you write poetry? Listening to you, I've been feeling like you're a poet. I wouldn't say that I am, um, but I do think in the process of writing, I can say I had a lot of fun writing and playing around with words. And um, I think gardening itself is a form of poetry. And, um, you know, for years, people meet you as a gardener and they say, oh, are you an artist? And I'd always say, no, no. But there's a garden historian whose work I've always liked named Mac Griswold. And she says, that gardening is the slowest of the performing arts. So now I say, yes, I'm a, yes, I'm an artist. I'm in the performing arts. I, I, I'm a gardener. <laughs> and I'll fit poet into that, I guess, too. Yeah, no, was, uh, several of the comments, I've tr I'm trying to save this um, chat so that I can share it with you. It's very complimentary. Um, and words like lyrical and... Um, uh, wonderful, all sorts of things about your presentation. And I want you to um, have access to all of that. So I will be emailing you the document later. Um, well, thank you. And if you think this is lyrical, read the book because I really <laughs> took time with that. This is me late at night. <laughs> Yes, because it is late at night there. Well, you have to remember that you're you're going to start yawning any minute. Has, uh, has the summer's wet weather that you have, uh, wet weather, affected your plants? It has. I mean, we were like you in drought all spring. And then we went to really what's felt like a monsoon season. Uh, I think it's been nearly three weeks of rain. Um, I don't remember anything like this in my entire life. So a lot of the orchardists around me are finding that their fruits are splitting now because you know how it is as a gardener. If you go from drought to too moist, tomatoes split open, pears split open. Um, but at the same time, whenever you've been in a drought, you just have to prefer seeing your aquifers recharged and a landscape rebound because of such deep, deep watering and um, but every season provides its challenges and that's why biodiversity is so important and why diverse farms are important. If you're planting 70 miles or 70 acres of soybeans, you're gonna be collecting a lot of insurance money every third year, but because crop failure is crop failure. But if you're planting a diverse garden or a diverse farm, You'll always have some success stories and some failures, but you minimize your failures. And that's part of, I think garden has so many wonderful lessons to teach us from patience to looking at every spring as a, an opportunity for fresh change and starting over again. Yes, um, I wrote down and Ida is asking uh, about the Griswold quote, was it Mac? Griswold? Yes, that's her name, M-A-C. Okay, and uh, so it's Mac Griswold, everyone. Um, Mary says children in her neighborhood, including herself, foraged and ate natal plums from a neighbor's hedge until the neighbor asked their mothers to tell them to slow down because she made jelly out of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's great. great. Um. I, I wrote down a quote. And I'll just say, if that was me, I'd tell the neighbor kids to come help me pick them all. Oh, yeah. I'll turn right. them into jelly and share it with you if you help yeah. me harvest. Because again, we need to get creative about the ways that we build the reward into it. Because no kid just wants to go out and do all your weeding. But when we show them the sweet, <laughs> sweet rewards in gardening like that, it's part of the success story behind it. I was um, enamored by your saying in the language of flowers section that flowers were the emojis of their day. I just, I'm going to be um, quoting you on that because I think that's just a really great picture of what 
the language of flowers was in comparison to what we have right now. I, I just love that. So thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. A lot more depth is, to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and fragrance. <laughs> Okay, Robin's asking what your source for the nutritional differences between organic and non-organic food. Um, most it stu is... science studies understand other values, but not nutrition. And that's really a part of what I love about the shifts that are taking place with new generations of scientists. We're starting to be able to analyze those things. When you post this talk, the, that is cited in the slide. I don't think I can toggle back to it effectively right now, but okay. the study was noted in, this, in the image itself. Okay, that's good to know. I'm going to tell everyone here, and I'll be telling um, everyone in uh, the newsletter as well, um, or somewhere, that... Uh, John is giving us permission. We've recorded this with his permission, this presentation, and it will be going up on our YouTube for a certain amount of time of, to be determined of whether it's a few weeks or uh, sometime after that. So I'll let you know what that is so that everyone can uh, see it again, or if people have missed it, they can, they can see it. So that's over on our YouTube. And you might have noticed, I'm just going to take a little time, John, to segue into our YouTube. Two of our past meetings have been taken down recently per our agreements with the speakers. And it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. We were given permission to the time that and definitely at the information of about their websites and their products and their books could be, um, it, it's still on our YouTube. So when you go over there, um, you'll see me where there were really great speakers before. Sorry about that. But anyway, so um, as far as I might be through with the questions, and now people are saying things, how incredibly inspiring this is. I, um, I, it made people feel nostalgic for when they lived on the East Coast many years ago in the natural beauty and all. So you've really, you've really touched our uh, members here tonight, and they are responding in kind to yeah, you know, everything that you've talked about, it, it really plays to our uh, desires to mentor the next generation and to plant diversity diversely and to use natives and, and to understand all of that um, better and then use it uh, more, not be buying it at the store and leaving it on the tree. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. Thank you. And I hope you'll find, you know, I think right now we're in a nation that really needs to find some common ground and generations need to find common ground. And I hope this bridges generations from grandparents to grandchildren. I know a lot of grandparents are getting this for their grandkids. A lot of people are exploring ways to rebuild community based in what we can do as gardeners. And I think these are really important times to be rebuilding. And again, let's use our superpowers as gardeners to do that and share some seeds of positive changes through what we can do. Oh yeah, hey, you said that that seed packet, that historic seed packet was tied with milkweed twine? Yeah, so milkweed and dogbane, a whole bunch of those native plants are cordage plants that were used to make twine. And milkweed, when the stalks die, they you just roll them and the fibrous bits remain and all the, the other parts break away and it forms a very strong uh, twine. 
And that particular seed packet was three bands of milkweed twined or spiraled together and rolled around to make one strong piece of twine. Okay, so, so that, I'm going to try to make twine out of my milkweed, my tropical milkweed. I, I'll make tropical twine, I guess. <laughs> tropical twine. <laughs> uh huh. I do live it's, in Southern California. <laughs> uh, I do I, live in Southern California, so maybe it'll be tropical twine. Well, I have tried. We so. I'm the executive director of a garden in Lee, New Hampshire called Bedrock Gardens. And there in, uh, as an ornamental, we grow a South American milkweed. Um, sorry, but it's called hairy balls and <laughs> for good reason. But it, it also being a, a more tropical um, milkweed, I have tried it and it does make cordage as well. So I'm guessing yours will too. I'll report in over on Facebook if I get it to do that. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm, we're coming to the end here unless somebody else has a, a, a question. I want to, John in the East Coast to be able to uh, go on to uh, um, decompress after giving a presentation and before bed, so. Thank you, John, very much. You'll be getting an email from me about all sorts of things uh, tomorrow and uh, we'll um, do all our business like that we talked about earlier, okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. Really great to meet you and I hope I'll see you in the gardens. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.